brilliant. Good stuff. Thank you, Nick. Okay, off we go. Off we go. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought I'd started the slideshow, but it looks like I haven't there. Is that in the right mode for everybody? Can we see the first slides? That, that looks like the title slide to me, Nick. Yeah. And that's changed now to contents on my screen. Has it changed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is really this picture showing you the list of things I'm talking about is as, as much to help people watching the recording as anything else, because it means you'll be able to go through to find the section you want to look at. So if you're struggling with Essex Skipper, for instance, and telling it from Small Skipper, you could skip through to the fifth section by looking to see where you are in, in that list. Um, but it also tells you the way I'm going through them tonight, approximately. I'm going to come back to this. I keep saying this every time because I think it's so important. We, we tend to get rather bogged down with thinking, oh, that butterfly is a particular colour and wondering about how I'll identify it when I look in a book or an app on my phone later. But please remember that the most important thing, you need to know the colour, but you need to know about the details, which are usually at the wing edge. It's so important to look at details at the wing edge. So you do want to know the colour and you want to know approximately the size, but the wing edges are usually very important. And in addition to all that, it is worth spending a little bit of time just observing what the butterfly is actually doing. If it's just sitting still, then it's not very helpful. But if it is moving about, is it moving about to look for and chase other butterflies, which means it's probably a male? Or is it apparently investigating plants and not flying around all that much? And then it's probably a female. Let's start into the nympallids. So we've got basically orangey coloured butterflies. They're not all orangey coloured, but basically that's the sort of hue of them. And the most orange are the small tortoiseshell and comma. And the painted lady can be quite orange, but usually looks to my eye anyway, a sort of pinky shade of orange. And then you've got the very dark limb pallets, the peacock and the red admiral. And we should all know, I think, that this is a peacock. There's the name, just in case you were doubting it. And we should be able to tell that very easily because it's the only butterfly with four eyes like that. The emperor moth is similar, but it's not as big. It's not as colourful. And the underside, of course, is extremely dark like that. Because it spends most of its life hibernating inside dark spaces. Now, of those orangey coloured butterflies, these are the three that I put down as being orangey coloured. And we can see, and I hope that all of you are adding names to these as you look at the pictures. I didn't put them on so that you could, you could think about them before I tell you. So we've got the comma and look at the wing edge. Not only is it very ragged, which is an incredibly good clue, but in addition, it's got these yellow marks along the edge. If we look at the painted lady, there are no marks along the edge really, are they in the same triangular shape? And if we look at the small tortoiseshell, it's got these blue marks. So you can tell them apart just from the wing edge. If all somebody gave you was a little bit of the edge of the wing, if it's got these yellow triangles, it's a comma. If it's got these blue triangles, it's a tortoiseshell. If it hasn't got any of those triangles at all, it's a painted lady. So although they're all orange, they're all very different. The painted lady, of course, has these black and white tips, which are not quite the same, are they? In the tortoiseshell, that's got stripes, not a black and white triangular tip. So I hope they should be easy. Certainly they're easier than some of the others we'll be looking at. The undersides are a bit more problematic because they're all designed so these butterflies can sit somewhere dark, quietly through the winter and get through until the spring without being seen and eaten. We've got this similar wavy outline to the comma and it sits just like this all winter with its wings in this pattern. It doesn't close up like some butterflies do, it sits like that. So you've got this wavy outline and that wavy outline is repeated look in the light and dark of the two-tone uh, ground colour of the wing. The small tortoiseshell has a similar but not quite as jagged line between the light and the dark and the blue colour of those lunules, they're called those triangular, triangular marks, 
they're still visible on the underside. This is a peacock, and you can see that this line between the two areas of light and dark is straighter, and it's also less contrasty, isn't it? So this is slightly more contrasty and definitely more jagged. The actual wing shape itself is more jagged. This is less jagged. This is straighter. And the tortoiseshell, quite a lot more contrast. And you can see the blue. One potential confusion with all of those, if you don't get a good look at it, is the speckled wood. But you should be able to see, you usually can, this eye on the forewing. And the fact that it looks, to my mind, fluted or pleated, the veins stand out and make little, if the sun's shining, you get these little shadow areas, which are all caused by the, the shape of the wing. The others have got relatively flat wings, but the speckled wood has this fluted appearance. Red Admiral Painted Lady, the only similarity about these two, although they're very closely related genetically, is this triangular wing corner, black and white. But otherwise, they're really quite dissimilar, aren't they? The Red Admiral is black, mostly, with red, and the Painted Lady is orange, mostly, with black. So I don't think you'll be confusing them. Undersides, a little bit more similar, but the Red Admiral as we've said about the other um, nymphalid butterflies apart from Painted Lady, tends to hide away when it's trying to, it doesn't actually hibernate, but when it's trying to, to roost and spend time in poor weather out of the way of predators, it hides in dark places, so it's almost completely dark. It doesn't sit when it's roosting with these little bits of its wing visible, but I put them in this picture because that way you can see that it is a red admiral, you can see the red stripe. The Painted Lady is from a desert region. Most of its life, it will have been, uh, the, the ones that are in the winter anyway, most of its life would have been in desert, very dry, sandy regions. And that's why this one looks like this, because it doesn't hide away in dark places. It spends any time when it's roosting, sitting either on the floor or a concrete wall or something like that, because it's made to be cryptically camouflaged on a very pale background. The eyes of the Painted Lady stand out much better, don't they, than the eyes on the Red Apple. OK, and the other butterfly that I threw in with this lot is not a member of precisely the same group. It's in the same uh, larger family, but the speckled wood is the one species I think you might confuse with an impalage because it's dark uh, and flies around in a similar way, but it's much more floaty, a much more uh, gliding and flapping flight than the nymphalids actually, but the speckled wood should be fairly easy because none of the nymphalids have got these pale creamy patches and they've certainly not got these eyes, these little eyes inside the creamy patches. And as I said about the underside, it's got this fluted appearance. So speckled wood is one species which looks dark. You might see it flying around above your head against the light and might think, oh, is that one of the tortoiseshells or peacocks or something, as soon as it gets so that you can see it and it isn't silhouetted against the uh, sky, you should be able to see those things which identify it. Now we're going on to the whites. So before we do that, any questions about the nymphalids? Okay, didn't think there would be there the easiest group, I reckon. Now the whites. I've told you um, that Looking for the colour is something you, you're going to do, but the wing edges are more help, and that's so true here. Looking at a white when it flies past you is almost no help at all, almost no help at all, because the colour's white, and that's about all it tells you, so it could be four species. But you might be able to judge roughly how big it is, and the smaller ones usually are orange tip, green vein, white, and small, whereas Usually, the larger ones are the brimstone and the large white, but unfortunately, the size of all these is a bit variable. So you can definitely find a large white the same size as a small white, although you don't normally. Normally, the large white is a bit bigger, but I wouldn't rely on that. If I see something large white flying around, I don't, I don't assume it's large white. I have to look at it more closely. If it's yellow, 
if you think to yourself, well, that looks yellow, then that is very helpful. There are, as you know, I hope, two yellow species, but also the small white can look very yellow in the summer brood when it's flying past you. So let's look at the two actually yellow ones first. The brimstone with its pointed wings, the little points here, which are very helpful because no other butterfly has got little points like that on a yellow background. And the clouded yellow. Now I imagine that clouded yellows, if they haven't, will soon be arriving in the country, so you could easily see one. They normally build up reasonable populations in, in the Chilterns. Um, you have to go to individual sites really to find them because what happens is a single female will arrive, lay eggs, and then late in the summer, perhaps September, you'll get quite a number of clouded yellows at the site where the eggs were laid, but they don't spread about much in September. So they tend to be big numbers at one or two sites. The white patch here in the middle of the brown patch on the cloudy yellow is quite helpful. If for some reason you can't see that the tips are pointy, so if the butterfly is a bit battered, that's a helpful thing. You might be able to see that even if the wing edges have got damage. But those are the only two yellow butterflies. The small white looks a bit yellow, but when it settles, you'll see that actually it's, a, it's not a yellow butterfly. It's either a small or a large white. Now, the difference between the small and large white is very helpfully that the small white has a small amount of black here. And I'd be completely prepared to accept that anyone who wants to argue with me that isn't black, that's grey. OK, but it's such a small amount of black, tiny black dots that they look grey. And they only cover a relatively small part of the wing. If we look at the large white, hopefully, there's a large number of black dots and they cover a large area. They come right down this edge, which I think is called the trailing edge. They come right down this edge till past halfway. So this spot called the cell spot is about halfway across the wing and they come below that. That's well worth remembering that the large white, the large amount of black comes more, more than halfway down the wing. Now, in that picture, you will have noticed that the oh. female, which was on the right, had more dots on it than the male on the left. <laughs> so in this picture, I'm showing you that that is the case for most of the whites, not with the orange tip, but for most of the whites. The male has a single spot <laughs> and the female has multiple spots. So it doesn't matter whether it's a small white, a green vein white or a large white, that is the case. The male is a single spot, sometimes the spot's completely missing. And the female has a few more spots. And you'll notice, and this is usually the case, the female's very pale black, grey coloured tip comes a little bit further down the wing, but it's nowhere near halfway. So you can sometimes, and in the summer you might, see a small white where this black tip is actually better marked than in my picture here, but it never comes down to halfway. The female brimstone looks white in flight, but when it settles, you can see it's this pale greeny colored. It's still got these points which allow you to identify the brimstone. The green vein white, which looks white in flight when it settles, if you're lucky, it will be as stripy as this, and that's fairly obvious then. But what you should be looking at are the wing edges, because there are always these little gray triangles coming in from the center of the wing and widening out towards the edge. So a green vein white always shows that doesn't matter whether it's a male or a female, they come down the wing to about the same distance as the large whites black area did, but they're not a continuous solid black line. They are lots of separate little triangles. So if we look at the undersides, we can see similar differences in that the small white has 
a very small area at the top here, which is where the black is on the other side, but it looks yellow on this side. I'm not quite sure how that works. And the hind wing is yellowish, which is why it sometimes appears yellow in flight, but it's sort of gray smudges here. The green vein white has pronounced amounts of gray or black dots along the veins. They go from the body out towards the edge. And they are usually more pronounced in the female. The male, they can be so pale you can hardly see them. The large white has a lot of black. Not only that the wingtip is obvious, even through looking against the, the light here, you can see it quite clearly, but also the hind wing is covered with lots and lots of tiny black dots. Look. So once again, it's really helpful. Small white, very small amount of black. Large white, very large amount of black. Green vein white with the black along the veins and in little triangles at the edge on the upper side. Now, I'm mentioning orange tip just because there is a slim possibility that you'll see one now. I think they're finished. I don't think any of us are going to see a, an orange tip from now on. But this is the male, remember, with its orange tips and that beautiful underside. The female has no orange, and it is just possible you'll see one. But you can easily tell it from the other whites because it's got this um, <coughs> checkered wing edge black and white checkers. So if you were thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, the small white should have less black than that. And it's like a large white because the black comes more than halfway down the wing, but look at this checkered edge. So that's a female orange tip. This is a female, no it isn't, this is a male green vein white. It's a male because it's only got the one spot. And look at these triangles coming in. This one is really well marked. So although they are quite black, they're not like the large, where it has a continuous black strip with little triangles on the green veined white. And as it says here, always you expect the females of the green vein white, the small white we even got on this page, and the large white, to have more black. But it still follows the rule I've explained. So we're on to the blues next. Any questions about the whites? I bet there are, but is anyone brave enough to ask? <laughs> no, good, crack on. So the blues. Now you probably know, if you've been in on the talks recently, that Colin made his own effort to try and separate the blues out. And I think that's a really good idea. He produced a sort of a chart saying if it's got this, then it's probably that. And if it's got this other thing, then it's probably something else and so on. And it's a really good exercise to go through if you struggle with the blues. Produce your own key, your own Excel spreadsheet, whichever way you do it, to list out the differences between the blues. Because just creating it makes you think about it and will help you remember. But I'm going to give you a couple of things now and I'll do it really quickly. You can look at them again in the recording later. So the smallest blues in our area are the small blue and the brown argus, which often is almost the same size. So you can see really tiny brown argus, although some can be about the same size as a common blue. The common blue usually is slightly bigger than the holly blue. And they're both about the same size as a purple hair streak, which I know isn't a blue butterfly, but when it's flying around, it can look very similar to a blue butterfly because it looks silvery, basically. The largest are the chalk hill and the domes. So the size gives you a clue. The fact that it's blue, of course, is a clue, or silvery blue might be more accurate. And you can tell quite a bit from the color of blue. The Adonis blue when you've seen one, you will know <clears throat> such an amazingly brilliant blue that it's really hard to confuse it with anything else. The pale, purpley ones, the common blue and the holly, whereas all the rest just look silvery, including the purple hair streak. And you could produce something like this for yourself. If we just go through this key quickly, 
Does the upper wing colour seem to be brown? So your opinion when this butterfly flies past you is that it looks like a blue butterfly. The question is, is it apparently silvery on the underside, but actually brown on the surface or blue? So if it's brown on the surface, if your opinion is, well, it looks like a blue butterfly, but it seems to be more brown than blue, then it's either brown argus, small blue, or a female of three species. In other words, there are five that look blue initially, but when you look at them more closely, you think, well, actually it's brown. And of those five, if it's really tiny, near kidney vetch, probably a small blue. If it's a bit bigger and it's away from kidney vetch, then it's either a brown argus or it's one of these three females. And if it is one of those three females, the best thing is to look at the males which are flying around nearby, unless you get a good look at the underside. But now onto the Oops, sorry. Now onto the species that look blue when they're flying about and continue to look blue even when they're settled. The palest and usually seen flying around above head height. They do uh, lay their eggs and hatch out from pupa, which are in bushes. Bushes which are usually just above head height, that sort of height. So that's a good place to... Um, to find them, and that's why I'm saying here, if you see something which is very pale blue and it's flying around the tops of some bushes, it's probably a holly. If it's about the same size, but slightly more purple in its hue and flying around close mm -hmm. to the ground, it's probably a common. If it's extremely bright blue and flying close to the ground, it's a domus. And if it's so pale, it's sort of a chalky blue, almost white, then it's a chalky blue. But the brown females are very difficult. You cannot possibly identify them in flight. So I would suggest to you that of the brown females, the only thing you can do is hope they settle and you can see the underside, or perhaps make a guess for your own satisfaction by looking at the males which are around about as well. Please remember that the holly blue females are entirely blue. It is the only one of our British species which has blue males and blue females. Well, that's not quite true. It's the only one of our British species, apart from, from the large blue, which we're not going to see in this area of Britain. So let's look at this pair to begin with going through, because this is, I think, the best way to sort them out. So you've seen what looks like a blue butterfly flying about. And when it settles, you can see that it looks basically white or silver on the underside. There are only two species which have no red, as it says here, no red at all. Two species in the Chilterns. And one of them is this, which I'm hoping you've worked at, is holly blue. You can tell that because the white background has streaks not spots, and the forewing is checkered with little black marks going through the white border. And this is small blue, and the small blue doesn't have streaks, it has dots of black, each of them ringed with a white halo. So really, even if you only see the underside, they should be very simple to tell apart. If they open their wings, it's even easier because the small blue is this colour, which if you're being generous, you could call navy blue, but it's more like slate. And the holly blue is always this colour blue, very pale blue. So that's quite easy. So there are two species with no red anywhere, no red at all. This one is the holly blue, which is streaky. And this is the small blue which is spotty. The small blue isn't actually blue but the holly blue definitely is. So all the other blues that we're going to look at in the UK and definitely in the Chilterns have some red in this area here. So when the wings are shut you should be able to see some red or orange. It can be very faint but it should be there. 
So here's some where it's so pronounced, it even shows on the upper side, not just on the underside. So these females are the ones you're most likely to see in the Chilterns. On the left, we've got common blue. And the common blue, as it says in the text underneath, in addition to the red here, has some blue scales on the wings near the body. And in my opinion, the most important thing to remember about the common blue is that the borders are completely clear of any other marks. They're just white. There's nothing but white. Clear borders, clean borders, white borders. This is a brown argus. It's more contrasty looking than a female common blue. The male and the female brown argus both look just like this. No difference between them in terms of their appearance. They have checkered borders look. You can see the black veins in the border. So unlike the clear border of the common blue, the brown argus has got these checkered borders. And it looks, overall, it just looks somehow smarter and sharper, more contrasting. So if we see them sitting with their wings open like this, we know this is common blue because of the clear borders. This is a brown argus because of the black veins going through the wing edge. If we see them with their wings shut, it's even easier. This is better because the common blue, which of course has got completely clear borders, has a dot just there, which is missing. Look, empty space, it says. So the common blue has a dot there and a smooth arc dots on the underside. So going around on the hind wing, you see I've just highlighted in red, a smooth arc like a letter C. But if we look at the brown argus, there are two spots here which appear to make the shape of a colon or a figure eight. There's nothing like that on the common blue. And it's just this spot here has moved apparently to there. It should be about there, shouldn't it? To make a smooth arc. It should be there somewhere, but it's moved into that position. So common blue and brown argus do look superficially similar, but actually there's quite a lot of differences between them. The males, they're perhaps easiest told by the shade of blue, but this isn't a brown argus male. Remember, they're all brown. So you're not going to see a brown argus male because it looks exactly like the female brown argus. Exactly like that. This is a male common blue. And we know that because of the clear white border. So this is a male of something else. It does not have a clear white border, but it does have this exquisitely bluer than blue colour. So this one is a Adonis blue. And it's slightly larger than the common blue. If we look at the undersides, one of these is the Adonis and one is the common. So look at them and decide for yourself which is which. You can probably tell from the blue colour that you can just see on the one on the left. But Remembering that common blue always has a completely clear fringe, a clear border of white. It should be pretty obvious that this one is the Adonis because it's got a checkered border. And this one must be the common because it's got a clear border. So here's something to have a guess at. What two species are these? On the left, that's the upper and under of the same butterfly. And on the right, the upper and under of the same species of butterfly. It's actually two different butterflies because I took them on different days. But what do you reckon these are? If you've seen this slide before, it's a bit easier, but you should remember from what we've just said. This is white with no red at all. So it's either holly blue or small. This has got some red in it, so it could be brown argus but it, that's not like, possible because that's the male of this and the brown argus that's the brown the brown argus male is brown okay let me speak and so therefore it's either adonis blue chalk hill blue 
or common blue. And we look at the borders and we are aware that it must be common. And we can see that this is a blue butterfly, so it must be holly. Common blue and chalk hill blue. Uh, we're not going to see chalk hill blue flying around until late July, perhaps even not until August. But once again, the fact that the common blue has a clear border helps us to tell it from the chalk hill blue. So just like the Adonis, it's got these black marks, just like the brown Argus, it's got these black marks, and just like the holly blue, which has these black marks. So the only species with this clear border in the Chilterns is the common blue. The chalk hill blue is pretty obvious once you see it sat with its wings open because it's so pale, so very pale. It looks like it's been drawn with um, pastel sticks, if you know those chalk pastel sticks that I'm referring to. And the Adonis blue and the chalk hill blue, as in this particular picture, are often seen feeding on the flowers in exactly the same area because they both feed on the same food plant, horseshoe vetch. But um, that's something that is a delight to see them together. So here we've got three species. I wonder, what do you reckon? Which one's got a clear border? One. Oh, I reckon it's pretty obvious this one's common blue. Clear border. Donis blue and chalk hill both have black veins, but which of these is which? And I think pretty obvious that one's the Adonis, isn't it? It's far too blue to be a chalky. And notice that the chalk hill blue the forewing is really pale compared with a slightly sandy colour, round colour of the hind wing. The Adonis, the difference between these two wings is not as great. Okay, now the females, as I said, they are tricky. I'm not going to pretend they're not, they are difficult. It is entirely possible that you will see a female of one of the three blue species and think I haven't got a clue because I think that fairly often. The common blue is the easiest of these to separate from the others because if the female is fairly fresh, what do we know about the border? Yeah. Yes, whoever said clear, you're quite right. And I was hoping that everybody was thinking it. So clear borders, common blue, but these are tricky. Now I have put, as you might have worked out, Adonis first, as soon as I wrote it in that order on the top. This is the Adonis blue and this is the Chalk Hill blue, but they are damn near identical. If you see a really fresh Adonis blue female, I don't know if you can see it, I can see it on my screen, just here where the red lunules are on the hind wing is also just a hint of blue. And if we look at the Chalk Hill blue, where the red lunules are, it's white and the little spots underneath the red. But unless your Adonis blue female is pretty fresh, that blue colour will have faded and they'll look impossible to tell apart, in my opinion. This is the undersides, again. There, there just isn't enough difference that you can confidently tell them apart. So it's a good idea to look to see which male butterflies are flying about nearby. If you think to yourself, well, that looks like a female Adonis, but all the males are chalk hills, then it's probably that you've seen a female Adonis that looks an awful lot like a chalk hill, because they do. Right. Um, I've added this in because when you see them flying high above you in a tree, it can be difficult to tell this, which is a purple hair streak, from this, which is a holly blue. So obviously the purple hair streak is not exactly a member of the blues, although it's in the same larger family group. If you see it sitting low down with its wings open, this male is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And so is the female. But we don't often get to see them like this. They're normally <clears throat> flying around the top of a tree. So up there against the light, they can appear to be just a blue butterfly and they look silvery. But in actual fact, if you manage to get a look, and I would 
certainly advise taking binoculars, if not a telescope, then you should be able to see that there is this white stripe across it, as there is in all the hair streaks, apart from the green, where it's broken up into little dots. But there's a white stripe across here, and it's got two little red spots. And of course, as we know, because we just went through it, the holly blue has no red anywhere. So it is a possible confusion and the purple hair streaks will be flying, I should think, by the end of the week in our region. So you might look up into a tree and see something silvery flying about and then think, oh, is that a purple hair streak? Could it be a holly blue? Here's how you tell. Look for the stripe across the middle and those red eye dots, they actually stand out better than you might think, even from a distance. Um, while we're on the subject of hair streaks, I thought I'd throw this pair in. In the Chilterns, we're only going to see white letter hair streak. But if you go just a bit further north into the um, Vale of Aylesbury, you might see the black hair streak. And the difference is that where we've got a black line here, on the inside of that red band, with the black hair streak, you've got separate black blobs on the inside. Um, so before we look at some moths, any questions, anyone, about blues and hair streaks? Quick one, Nick, if I can, on white letter hair streak. If you want the, um, I guess, habitat preference and food plant preference for white letter, please. Yep. It's usually seen where there are elm trees because the caterpillars eat elm and they'll eat any species of elm. Um, you can find white letter hair streaks away from elm, but they are usually near elm. And they're quite fond of um, creeping thistle. So if you can find some elm trees <coughs> and some creeping thistle nearby, you can fairly often find the white letter hair streaks down on the thistles, which is a good thing, because otherwise they're at the top of the tree and very difficult to see. Okay, so largely, I guess, will be a hedgerow where there's still elm left in hedgerows and those. Yes, all yeah. woodland edges. Yeah. Hedgerows yeah. and woodland edges. Um, Thank which you. Which elm is slightly more likely to survive long enough to have hair streaks in? Mm -hmm. so you've got lots and lots of tiny English elm. It can be used, but it's used less often than taller trees, which usually in our area are which elm. Okay, great. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Right. A few day flying moths, I've literally put in, what is it, seven here, of the hundreds that you might see. Uh, many of them are tinier than this, and I've had complaints in the past about the fact that they're too small to be seriously worth considering. I don't agree with that, but let's just stick with these bigger ones. So there's two possible confusion types of red and black. The stripy one is the cinnabar, and the spotty one is the burnet moth. Now, the burnet moth comes actually in three different flavours. So count the spots. In our area, we get narrow bordered five spot. And this one is five spot. Look, one, two, three, four, five. And you can also get a six spot burnet in our area. And the sixth spot would be just here where my mouse is at the moment. So look for that extra spot or the lack of it to work out if you're looking at narrow bordered five spot or six spot burnet. If you go down into Berkshire and very southern Oxfordshire, you might see a five spot burnet, but we haven't got that. We've got the narrow bordered in the Chilterns. And the difference between the narrow bordered five spot burnet and the five spot burnet is almost nothing. But we know there's a difference because the caterpillars look different and they feed in a slightly different way and pupate in slightly different places but the adults look near identical. Here's a common carpet. There's another very similar species called the silver ground carpet that you might see. All the carpets are very pretty in my opinion. Here's a little mint moth. This one's a micro moth actually, but it's very pretty. You might see that. A yellow shell comes in various guises with this brown mark sometimes almost completely absent and just completely yellow with a white line across. Silver wire migrant, which is hearing good numbers at the moment. I expect all of you have seen one of these during the last couple of weeks. They are very fast flying when you disturb them. They come out of the grass at your feet and zip off and 
immediately bury themselves back in the vegetation a bit further ahead of you. They very rarely do what this one obligingly is doing and sit in the open. Now, they normally throw themselves back into the vegetation. And that, that's one way, actually, that most moths can be told from butterflies, that whereas butterflies fly ahead of you and then land, usually in the open, in the sun, moths try to get underneath something and keep themselves in the shade. And this is a treble bar. And once again, there are two types of treble bar, lesser treble bar and treble bar, which are very difficult to tell apart. So I understand why some people might say, Oh, these moths are a bit difficult. I'm still trying to learn the butterflies. Okay, that's absolutely fine. But I think if I if I can, I would encourage you, as soon as you start to feel confident about some butterflies, start looking at the moths as well. They're just as pretty and they're as worthy of our conservation as the butterflies, but they tend to get a bit overlooked because people look at the butterflies first. And there are actually more moth species. So once you've cracked the something like 35 butterfly species you're likely to see in the children. Get on and have a go at some of those moths. Okay, skippers. Um, I mentioned here that the dingy skipper has a second brood, which could be late July and August. Maybe this year it won't, because the dingy skipper flew a bit late in the spring, and just possibly the caterpillars won't have time to develop. On the other hand, July, and not July, June, has been really warm, warmer than usual. So those caterpillars will have grown pretty fast, I think. So we might well see some dingy skippers late in the year. But most of the skippers we're going to see, the summer skippers, as I would call them, are the ones which are sandy orange. And they're really difficult to see where they're going because they zip about and they change direction very quickly. But as it says here, if you scare one away, if you're walking towards something and it flies off, from in front of you and you think that looked like a little orange skipper stay where you are it will probably come back now i've included a skipper here that you're not likely to see at the moment so you are likely to see this one on the left the large skipper large skipper by name but actually tiny smaller than most of our other butterflies that we're seeing at the moment and over here, I've got the silver spotted skipper. Now, already I've had one person send me a photo of a large skipper saying, could this be a silver spotted skipper? These spots seem very pale. Well, they can. I'm afraid it was a large skipper this person hoped was a silver spotted. Um, the large skipper normally looks like the one in my <coughs> picture, but the spots on the wing can be much paler, both on the upper side and especially these spots here on the underside can be very much paler, which is why I've put this picture in here, showing that if you've got three white spots just there, and I mean white, you've actually really have found a silver spotted skipper. I think if you're only looking at the upper side, they're really difficult to tell apart really difficult to tell apart because you can get some very pale large skippers but the underside this definitely identifies silver spotted skipper those three marks there are never present on large skippers but this band of spots here can be very pale those there can be very pale on a large skipper and that does cause confusion anyway Silver spotted skipper shouldn't be flying around until August, but let's not worry about it yet. But these two are um, small skipper, which is this lad. And it is a lad because that black mark is something that only the males have. And it, you can see it's quite long and curved, whereas I've said here that this, which is the Essex skipper, has a short mark, relatively speaking. Otherwise, they look really similar, don't they? And for that reason, in some recording schemes, you can record it as a small or Essex skipper because you just can't tell. But if you can see it sitting with its wings open and you can see this mark, then you can tell a longer mark for the small skipper and a shorter mark for the Essex. 
a better way of telling these two apart because it works for the males and the females. Remember, only the male has that black mark we just talked about, is to look at the antenna. And a small skipper gets gradually darker all the way along. And then, slightly oddly perhaps, changes back to brown. So it gets darker and darker and darker, and then it becomes brown. The Essex skipper stays pale all the way along, and then it goes black. You have to be looking at the underside of the antenna. It does not work to look from the top because small skipper can have black tips on the top, but when you get underneath, you can see that the tips are not black. They can be brown, quite dark brown, but they're never black contrasted so strongly with an orange stem. So here we've got two species, which I'm hoping you could tell me without me announcing, so you look at them for a moment. And I put the relative sizes about right here. So this one is slightly bigger, but there's not much in it, is there really? And what have you decided? This one, large skipper. I hope you got that. So you can see these spots. Whereas this one is one of the two, which is completely uniformly sandy orange. And I've just put small in Essex because from this view, we can't be really sure what's happening there. It could be that this is an Essex skipper. I'm tempted to think it probably is because the underside is so uniform. The small skipper tends to have a slightly greenish patch just here. Uh, and this stem appears to be orange all the way until it turns black. But from that picture, I wouldn't want to make a comment on the species there. So it's one of the smaller Essex, but this is definitely large. And another butterfly of similar colour, but you could be confusing with those skippers. Don't think you would because it's a completely different shape. Look, but this wonderful little butterfly with its bright orange and black contrasting, it's called the small copper. Whereas oops, over here, we've got a small heat at the bottom. So these are small coppers up at the top, and this is small heat at the bottom. And I've referred to the bright streak. That streak going halfway across, across the wing is the determining feature for small heat when we're trying to compare it with other orangey brown butterflies. So small copper, large skipper, Small skipper, these are very triangular, aren't they? Small copper, when we look at it, is more rounded. Small heath is more rounded still. But before we start the browns, let's see if there are any questions about those butterflies. Wow, I must be doing a brilliant job. Nobody's asking any questions. I must be making it so clear. Or Everybody's given up hope. No, that's not the thing. Right. In the, in the spring, we had a fairly easy time separating the browns because there's only two, speckled wood and small heath. But now we've got a bit more of a problem because we've got the speckled wood, the ringlet and the meadow brown, all of which look dark. And I haven't seen one yet, but very soon the gatekeepers will be out. One or two people have seen them in this area. And that gatekeeper looks a lot more orange, more like a small heath, although it's a bit bigger. So with all these browns, the best thing, if you can, is to look at the underside. The underside of these butterflies is the key part. So the wing edges are helpful, but the wing edges of the underside. As I mentioned, the marbled white is in the brown family that we're sort of leave that for now because that one's too easy and it isn't brown so it isn't a confusion. So let's look at the browns that fly in the summer and I've started here because this is a, a, a pair that some people find confusing. Um, the gatekeeper which is far more orange than the meadow brown. The gatekeeper is smaller 
And as you can see, inside this eye spot, there are two white pupils. Over here, the meadow brown, there is a single white pupil. Now, it might be you're wondering, why has he got two slightly different versions of Gatekeeper and two slightly different versions of Meadow Brown? I wonder, you're thinking, being astute people, if that's because one is a male and one is a female. And astute people, you are correct. Here's the males at the top, which are darker. And here are the females at the bottom, which are more orange, they're paler. And the females are slightly bigger too. So this male is probably a bit oversized in that particular picture. I should have shrunk the picture slightly. The females are bigger. So anyway, gatekeeper, more orange, two white pupils. Meadow brown, much darker, one white pupil. But the undersides are even more helpful when you see them. Um, the small heath, which I mentioned earlier, looks a bit like a gatekeeper because it's very orange so when you see them flying you might think oh is that a small heath or a gatekeeper you'll never see a small heath sitting with its wing open so if a butterfly lands and has its wings open it cannot be small heath so here are the undersides which as i said are the best way to tell them apart and let's stick with the white pupils in the eye spots first of all here's a small heath single white pupil Here's the meadow brown, single white pupil. And here's the gatekeeper, two white pupils. Remember a little while ago, I said about the small heath, this pale streak comes halfway down the wing. In the gatekeeper, it seems to come halfway up the wing and there's an additional bit. And in the meadow brown, it goes right the way across. So the hind wing on the underside is a really good way to tell them apart. Half a white streak or pale streak. A larger white streak or pale streak is actually a sort of creamy colour, isn't it? And an additional bit in the gatekeeper. And the meadow brown with a streak that goes right the way across the wing. Now, the ringlet I've put here because, again, possible confusion. And when male meadow browns, which are these darker ones, get a bit worn, and the ringlets get a bit worn towards the end of July, they do look very similar. But notice on the hind wings, the ringlet has eye spots, and the meadow brown has none at all. The speckled wood has eye spots. But the speckled wood, as you will see, has each of its eye spots surrounded by a cream box. Here there's just a creamy coloured ring. But these are much bigger boxes, aren't they? And of course, the ball wing of the speckled wood has got all these creamy blotches, whereas this doesn't. The number of spots, by the way, the number of little black circle, uh, creamy circled black spots on a ringlet is quite variable. So don't be surprised if you find some of the different numbers of spots, but they always follow this pattern. The meadow brown never has extra spots. The undersides, again, to show that the undersides are key, a huge stripe right across the wing means that this must be a meadow brown and a single eye spot. A ringlet with lots of eye spots all over the place, the speckled wood with quite a few eye spots all over the place, but they're not haloed, are they, in the same way? And this one has got that fluty appearance. Do you remember we mentioned that, the pleating of the wing, speckled wood? And here's the small heath, which you'll remember has half a stripe of pale colour here, not a full stripe. I've oh, just noticed, folks, I don't know about anyone else, but we're having a very heavy rainstorm. That's a surprise. Uh, I, I looked up because I could hear it just ringing on the roof. Just after I finished watering the garden. So, meadow brown, full stripe. Ringlet, lots of creamy coloured 
creamy haloed eye spots. Small heath with half a pale stripe here and speckled wood. Quite a few eye spots, rather like the ringlet, but with this fluted appearance, which helps to separate it. And then the other brown, the one which hardly deserves to be in the same family, really, based on its colour, but its biology is very similar, is the marbled white. So a wonderful butterfly, which is really striking. And I don't think you could easily confuse that with anything except possibly the green vein white. But I've tried to show here. Can you see the dark colour goes across the wing in the marbled white? It goes across the wing from one side to the other. But the green vein white, it always goes along the veins from the body to the wing edge. So it's at 90 degrees to the colour marks on the marbled white. But I don't think you're going to make that mistake. There is such an obvious difference in the dark colour of a marbled white compared with a green vein white. OK, we're getting in towards the end, but any questions about the browns, people? All right, well, there are two fritillary species that look so similar, they're very difficult to tell apart in flight. Uh, but they can also, unfortunately, be confused with painted lady and comma, which look very orange and fly about in similar ways. And then there's the emperor, purple emperor and the white apparel, which could, if you see them against a, a, a sky and therefore they're just a silhouette, be confused with red apparel, because all three of these fly quite high in the sky. And you could easily see them way up above an oak tree and not be sure which. So we'll try and make that clear as we go through them. Let's start with the fritillaries, silver washed and dark green. And I remember, because I like simple memory tricks, the silver washed is the stripy woodland fritillary. It's got stripes of pale colour across the hind wing. And you almost always find it in woodlands. The wing tips are quite pointy. They're not actually pointed, but they are quite sharp angled, aren't they? Compared with the dark green fritillary, and again, using my simple memory trick, the dark green is the dotty grassland, because here instead of pale stripes, we've got pale dots, and it's almost always seen flying about in grassland. But more rounded wings, hasn't it? So, if you're in a woodland and a fritillary flies past, mm -hmm. and if it sort of floats past rather than powers past you, if it's gliding at times, you might be able to see whether the wing shape is more pointy-ended or rounded-ended. And the more pointy-ended one would be the silver wash fritillary, which is what you would expect in woodland. When you're on grassland and fritillaries go past, they tend to go past really fast and they just don't stop because the dark green fritillary seems to be on a mission to fly as far as possible, as fast as possible, the whole of its life. Very occasionally you get lucky and a dark green fritillary will stop and feed on a knapweed, one of its favourite nectarine sources, but that isn't very often. The silver wash, stripy woodland, is much more likely to stop on flowers, so brambles and thistles in woodlands are good places to spot this butterfly and it will sometimes spend quite a long time feeding making photography easy but the dark green's a real challenge if we see them with their wings open once again relatively easy to tell them apart partly because of the wing shape but also because the silver wash fritillary the ground color is the same all the way from one edge of the wing to the other it does have this sort of greenish hue to it, doesn't it? But the orange goes all the way across the wing, the same colour orange. But the dark green fritillary seems, to my mind anyway, to get paler as it comes to the edge. And the very edge of a dark green fritillary is quite a bit paler in the females. The males, that's not quite so true. But the female dark green, it definitely has paler edges. 
Let's leave the fertilities and move on. The purple emperor and the white admiral. Now, using my simple memory tricks, we'll remember emperors have eyes. E -E. There are eyes on an emperor and there are none on a white admiral. If they're sailing about above your head, high against the sky and against the light, they can be really tricky. But if they settle somewhere and you can see them, because quite often if they settle high up, there'll be leaves in the way, then look for the eyes, because the emperor's eyes are really quite crucial as a simple way to identify the species. If you can't see the hind wing and you can see the fore wing, don't look for the purple colour so much because that's really hard to see if you're on the ground and they're above you. You tend not to see that then. But look at the fact that there's an extra eye spot just here. So the emperor has eyes and extra spots. Can you see there's only one spot here on the white admiral and two spots here. And the white admiral, this white stripe across here, is almost continuous as a single band of white, whereas the purple emperor is broken up a bit more, not quite so striking. Remember that the female purple emperor is not purple under any conditions. And the purple emperor, of course, is much bigger than the white admiral, but when they're way up above you at the top of an oak tree, that's hard to tell. Um, you can tell quite often by their flight the white admiral has a much more flap, glide, flap, glide sort of flight. And the purple emperor tends to power ahead as if it doesn't know the meaning of glide, unless the purple emperor is way up and then decides to come down to the ground when it can glide down. But it doesn't normally in level flight flap and glide the way the white admiral does very frequently. On the underside, we can use the same memory trick that the emperor has eyes, because now it's actually got two which are visible. And once again, the white admiral has none. And that white stripe that I mentioned being sort of continuous on the white admiral, well, it isn't quite lined up in this picture, but the white here is, is more obviously white, isn't it? There's more, in my opinion, a wider band on the emperor, You've got this little tooth on the white band just there, not so on the white apple. So there are various things you can use, but generally speaking, you're more likely to see the purple emperors flying around quite high up, and it's hard to tell. Look for the eyes, you'll need binoculars, possibly telescopes, and then look at the width of this white stripe if you can see it. If the white admiral is at a similar height, obviously it will look smaller, but it's often difficult to tell because they're so high up. So there, look for the width of the white stripe across the hind wing. And the fact, as you can see in the picture, I've arrowed it, there's this white area here. So the overall appearance of the hind wing of the white apple is much paler. Okay. I'm going to mention recording in a moment. I'll just ask any questions about fertilities, emperors, admirals. Okay. Nick, right. sorry, yes. Doug, can, yeah, no, please do. Can come off me that quick. There's been quite a bit of chat on the um, on the group around the marsh fertility at Yosden. Right. Are you are you seeing many more of those around, or are they pretty much? one or two sites and i guess the question of are, are people likely to see one now or they've pretty much finished i think they're just about finished um and i think Euston's the only place you will like to see them there there were mm -hmm. a few at few not many at ivinghoe and i don't know of anywhere else in the chilterns that people have been seeing them so 2022 they were a number of sites um we believe without any proof that they were, we haven't got any proof that this is true. We think they were released. We think they were released again this year at, at Euston because the strange thing is, Euston does have a lot of the caterpillar food plant, but the butterflies are not flying where the food plant is. 
and in the autumn when people looked for the caterpillars feeding on the food plant they couldn't find them so despite the fact the marsh fritillary was seen last year uh, and seen again this year which could lead some of us to say those of us who are slightly more romantic than me perhaps to say wow it's come back isn't that wonderful um, those of us who, like me, are cynical, say, well, it's a bit strange there weren't any caterpillars, and why are the butterflies all flying about at a part of the site where the food plant isn't? And if you go and stand where the food plant is, you don't see the butterfly. So it makes us a bit suspicious. It, it would be good if the marsh fritillary can come back to this area and breed self-sustained colonies. That would be wonderful. But my suspicion is they're being helped. And I don't think we're going to see, I mean, it is possible that somebody could go to Houston in the next week and see a mass artillery, but I don't think we're going to see them elsewhere. And I don't think they'll be around for much more than a week now. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Okay. So I'm just quickly going to mention recording. Of all the ways that you can record, and I must stress, please do record everything you see if you can, the most comprehensive way of recording is to use the iRecord app but there is a drawback with it which is you have to know the names of the things you want to record you can look at the picture guides but it's a lot quicker if you know what you want to say you've seen and if you don't know what you've seen I'm hoping the next picture is going to be iNaturalist and it is good I've got my slides in the right order I've been recently converted to recommending this because with iNaturalist, when you open the app on your phone, it's free, just like the iRecord app, free on your phone. When you open it, the first thing it says basically is, would you like to add a photo? So you open the app, then you take a picture of whatever it is you want to identify. And pretty quickly, you know, within a second, iNaturalist comes back telling you what, you've look, what you're looking at with a percentage chance of it being correct. So it will often suggest three names, one with a higher percentage of accuracy than the others. And then you can record it using that name if you think it's likely to be right. And later people will check it, that's real people, not just AI, to see whether they think you, you are right or whether possibly you're um, unable to tell because sometimes from a picture it isn't possible to tell. So iNaturalist is really good if you're not sure what you're looking at, it's really quick to use. Going back to iRecord, you can take pictures. In fact, iRecord like you to take pictures and add them to your iRecord records, but it's a fiddlier process. It's not quite as smooth, not as seamless, not as easy. So iNaturalist is good for that. If you're just recording butterflies and day flying macro moths, and I do strongly recommend I record butterflies because it's really quite easy to use, apart from one thing which I think is a bit daft. In order to record a list of butterflies at a site, rather than a single sighting, you need to press this button just here, this green one with a butterfly icon. You press that button just there and hold it down, and then it brings up this page which says species list or a timed count. But let's assume we want to go for a species list because we're uh, walking around a site where we want to make a, a list of all the things at that site. So we click now on species list. Uh, <laughs> and it takes us to the next slide. It wasn't supposed to do that. And when, it, when you click on the species list, it should be, I should have been bringing up another picture then to show you, but I must have messed up my slide, which shows you that it asks you for the date, which you will auto fill as being the day you're making the record, <coughs> the location where you have to write in the name of the place you believe you are, the closest village is good enough, and it will take GPS from your phone at that point, and then you can add the butterflies by clicking on the pictures, which are listed in order of what they expect you to see. So it's really easy to use. And you can just scroll through the pictures until you find one of the butterfly you're looking at, or moth, if you tell it that you'd like to do the moths as well. And then 
If you don't like doing it that way and you prefer writing everything on paper, please record by doing things like, for instance, going to the Butterfly Recording Butterflies for New Millennium, which is a butterfly conservation recording thing. It's, it's really a, a version of I record made for people who prefer to do it sitting down at their computer at home rather than using a phone out in the field. And that's it. Well done, everybody. You stayed the course. Um, I hope everyone found it useful. And at this point, if anyone's got any energy left after that, they might like to ask a question. So I'll wait and see. Brilliant. Thank you again, Nick, as always. Um, I guess the amount of times we hear it, there's always something new um, popping up, a new little tip or reminder. So it's very helpful. Thank you very much. So questions, anybody? Any? Sorry, Nick, were you going to say? No, no, no I'll just say that I'll be quiet. Questions? <laughs> No question, but just exactly what Nick said, Nick Mariner just said, it, the more times you hear it, the more it embeds in itself in us. And just seeing all your slides and listening to you again, and hear, actually even hearing that you've added in bits from last year. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm pleased it's helpful, Hazel. And obviously that's why I do it. And that's why each year I try to change it just slightly because I think well maybe if I mentioned this this will be something that people can pick up on I forgot to mention when we were doing the skippers that the large skipper I'm not going to go back through the slideshow now but the large skipper has pointy little twirly bits on the end of its antenna which is a useful guide to the large skipper you can often look at it and see that the antenna are not blunt ended but have extra pointy bits like the um the ends of the slippers Arabian style slippers. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody primed ready for one? Well, that brings us perhaps to, to talking Saturday. about Saturday. Yep. Yep. So, my experience of trying to park by what was a youth hostel and near the church on the road whose name I've forgotten is it called Bradnam? something lane anyway yeah, Bradham lane. yeah. Brad, okay so it can be that there are so many dog walkers parked there that there isn't much space but you can get onto the grass on the opposite side of the road where the cricket pitch is there is some parking there as long as you're careful and don't park in the middle of the cricket square you wouldn't be very popular but there is some parking on that side of the road as well a bit further across on the far side of the cricket pitch um, I confess to being unsure quite how you access it because I haven't ever had to do it but I have seen people drive across and park there so if when you come to park on Saturday you can't see a space because it's full up there is definitely some parking on the grass by the cricket pitch yeah and you can tend to find a space yeah. on the roadside as well yeah. so you should find someone somewhere yeah yeah you're quite right people do park on the road coming up from the Red Lion pub, I think, or is it the Golden? Anyway, what about pubs? The Red, Li the Red Lion Cafe. It is yeah, Red, Red Lion, Lion, is it? Okay. So as you come up that road, you can park on the side there. It's a bit dodgy. I wouldn't advise parking three cars together because you need to leave a bit of space for people to pull in. Does that make any sense? If everyone parks all in a block, it's much harder for, uh, for other cars to pass. But if you spread yourselves out a bit and leave space so that people who are trying to get past each other have got passing spaces, that makes it better. Yeah, I think give yourselves an extra five minutes to find somewhere to park just in case is a clue. Yes. And the, the weather area forecast is well, white cloud and 23 degrees on Met Office and quite still. Yeah. So it might not be a clear sunny day, but you anyway, it who knows? Actually, it could actually be better. Because, yeah, it might work in your advantage. Well, yeah. Generally speaking, you, you see fewer butterflies, but they actually have the decency to sit there and let you look at them if the sun's gone in. <laughs> and the undersides are very often what we want to see. So quite it could well be in our favour. It's certainly stuff. a day when you get some sunshine and some cloud is the easiest for looking at butterflies because when it's completely sunny, they all zip about like they're on amphetamines. <laughs> it makes it very difficult. Sounds good. So as with every session, I guess, enough water, sun cream, sun hats, the usual kind of drill yep. on that front. Your binoculars, camera uh, if you've got one. Binoculars yep. and nets, please. I don't think there's any restriction on using nets there. And nope. 
a few people with nets means that we get to see more. Um, we will release everything if anyone's wondering. Everything will be released unharmed, but just putting it in your net rather than saying, oh, there was something over here a minute ago. I wish everybody else had seen it. Mm -hmm. it. It just allows us to study things that bit more closely. That's good. And it's a 10.30 start, isn't it? So if you, I guess if you can arrive for quarter past 20 past 10 to get parks and ready, that would be great. And that you're aiming for around plus or minus a one o'clock finish, is that right? Well, I'm assuming it'll be that. I mean, obviously, yeah, if the weather right. turns nasty, we might finish of at course. 12.30. But, of course, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, some of the better bits are a, a good 15 minutes walk before we even get started. So, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. And it's if like you... Anyone who's not been, it is a lovely site. Just absolutely amazing. The way that it's been looked after. Yeah. We are very lucky that the, the tenant farmer there of the National Trust has actually as much interest as we have i think in it, it is having amazing. a nice and bit of habitat 20 years ago most of what you'll walk on would have been arable crops and is now probably some of the nicest grassland in, in our patch it's an, it's a great story so yes and when you finish the red line down the bottom does a great bacon sandwich nice lunch it's a really nice cafe as well so yeah any vegetarian <laughs> options in there uh, good question. I've I assume they must do. I've never <laughs> asked one, but they cheese. must. <laughs> I should they think. must do. Good cheese sandwich, if nothing else. Brilliant. Any any questions on the logistics for Saturday, or are you comfortable with where you're going? And I guess most of you've probably been there by now. In which case, well, we'll say thank you very much. And thank how about you. this? Would you like to record in the annals that uh, we finished ten minutes before I said? <laughs> yeah. Maybe 10 minutes me. after as usual and if all else fails on the day the whatsapp group is there for last minute logistics or i'm yeah, lost yeah. where do i park or those kind of last minute moments so use use the group for that if you need to between now and saturday yeah great thank you very much have you a great time have a great day saturday thank you. Thank you. Bye. see you saturday thank you.